Well, welcome to this session. I must say we've hit the lunchtime session, so most of you all must be very hungry. I hope you all are not going to leave in the middle because we're here to celebrate women in handloom. And I think it's a subject that's very close to my heart because, as you know, India has a 3,000-year history of textile traditions, weaving the most beautiful saris in every corner of India, and besides that, the khadi tradition as well. And these two ladies with me have done yeoman service to the industry, and the credit really goes to Indian women for having saved the handloom industry in this country. During the time of the British, they almost finished off all the handlooms of India, and all our fathers are standing there wearing clothes made out of Manchester fabrics, dressed in wool. Many of you may have seen the pictures of your ancestors dressed up like that, but the women never, always in a beautiful sari, whether it was a simple cotton or an elaborate silk, Indian women never let go of the handloom tradition, and that's why today India is the last country in the world to possess this immense traditional treasure of textiles. And Pavitra over here has done such fantastic work. She comes from a generation, uh, uh, the second generation actually, of a great tradition. Her mother was Chimi Nanjapa, who was a contemporary of Kamla Devi Chatobdiai and of Popul Jaikar. And these were the women who revitalized and re presented the handlooms of India to make it the wonderful fashion fabric it is today. We spend our lives telling you that khadi ought to be a luxury fabric. This is a handmade fabric. Look at the way the Japanese appreciate everything that is handmade. In India, we've gone towards the machine made. In handloom, we are not against the machine made. We say there is a time and place for it. But at the same time, we talk about why handloom should be the national treasure of India. Every single one of you have a commitment. This is our fabric of freedom. We walk as free men and women today because of what Gandhiji did with Khadi. And if we cannot repay that immense debt we have to this wonderful emotive fabric, then we shouldn't call ourselves Indians at all. But thankfully, with women like Pavitra and Lavanya around, I don't think there'll ever be any danger of losing sight of the objective. Tell us something about women in handloom, Pavitra. Uh, thank you for having me in this uh, program. I'm really privileged to be here. Uh, women in handloom has always, the women in the handloom industry have always been pre-loom. So they are the unseen faces that, uh, that are behind the sari. So man may weave it, but all the other things that go into making a sari are all done by the women. They are never put on the statistics or never counted as, uh, as part of the wages. And this is something that has always bothered me. And over the years, the good thing is we've managed to tell them that they have to give a hand to their husbands and man the shop or take care of production, which is a good thing, uh, especially seeing us as women. That was a great learning for them. And today, I'm happy to say a lot of women are participating. And Lavanya, you've been part of a textile tradition for five generations or more. And Nali silks is something that everyone in South India and many people in North India know as a platform for some of the finest handwovens in the country. What do you have to say about the state of this national treasure? So I, I'd like to believe that it's always going to continue to be a national treasure. Um, and I think that part is true. Um, where, where I'll give my comments more from what I see as a business person and from a more practical standpoint. Um, us having been in this business for five generations now. We started out as weavers and uh, moved into the retail trade, and now we've got the chain of uh, sari stores all over the country. We've got 9,000 uh, weavers that we, uh, suppliers, vendors, that's our base. Right. Um, and, out of, uh, and a lot of them are the long tail, which is smaller artisans, where we buy up their entire production capacity. Um, and our stronghold is, of course, in hand looms. What we've seen and what I'm seeing is there is that very strong um, uh, respect for, for saris, but it's more and more coming, uh, it's more and more becoming an occasion-led wear. And so there's a little bit of bifurcation where I do see, uh, I think a lot of women and a lot of men also do consider the sari as a national treasure. A lot of women do have these in their cupboards. But I think they, while they treasure them, they wear them less and less. 
And that's something that we're seeing for various reasons, convenience or for whatever. Uh, but fashion. younger women today are wearing saris in fantastic contemporary styles. Yes. I see designers like Abraham and Thakur and uh, Rajesh Pratap Singh send out saris on their young models, worn with t-shirts, worn with corsets, worn yeah. with all sorts of things. And even the drape has moved away from the standard ulta palla and seeda palla into something that's more drapey and more effective and more modern. So I think that everyone just needs a little bit of encouragement to make this happen. And we need to talk about sustainability because it's the new buzzword in fashion, sustainable fashion. But does anyone really know the meaning of what sustainable fashion is? I think it is something that is defined by the fact that we pay a fair price to a weaver, an artisan, enabling him to have a life that is full of comfort and good things. I think the time has come to remove them from, you know, that image of that poor peasant villager weaving inside his house and eking out a living and making ends meet. And the middleman comes and buys his product for a certain amount, which is finally sold in the cities for 10 times the amount. So how do we address that aspect of it? So um, the answer is in the question, right? Like the only, the only way where saris can thrive, because it, I think it will thrive, um, it's got to be a concerted effort. There's one aspect which is the branding, the perception, and you know, uh, where it, uh, what, what, it, what it means for a woman, right? It is a garment, but it's also beyond that, right? It's, it's adding beauty to your life. It's taking something that someone has painstakingly woven together. And of course, you can choose to wear it only for weddings and occasions like that. Or you can choose to wear it on a day when you're feeling a little low and you, know, you, and, and you want to uh, do all of that. But, but I think it comes down to, like you said, it has to be a sustainable livelihood for the artisan. It must provide gainful employment. Um, and it must be an accessible product. And if that's the case, then I think it will continue to thrive in our tradition. You see, today we face the onslaught of Chinese fabrics coming in, machine-made, power-loomed fabrics. And many Indian designers tend to use those to make clothes with. And I keep wondering, because in Japan, once Ise Miyake asked me, why don't all designers use khadi and the traditional textiles? Why are they all buying polyester and making little black dresses out of the whole thing? And the answer to that is really quite sad because the Indian fabric has the potential to become a global product. It needs to be put into the hands of a clever designer who can take and make something that has global resonance. Don't you think that time has come? So Pavitra? when you talk of uh, sustainability, for me, the primary thing is, I think the first thing as a designer is to put food on the table. How do you put food on the table by building up pride? Pride in their inheritance, telling them they've inherited something that the public wants. And that from the sense of building up a pride and putting food on the table, that is when he can start being creative. I mean, you can't expect anyone to work on a hungry stomach. So the first way we've worked is give him that security. And how we have worked is while we give a design, we always have a buyback so they can work in a risk-free environment that is very important towards sustainability. At a project called the Rajasthan Heritage Week, we gave the textile weavers, the printers, the dyers of Leheria, the beautiful block prints like Ajrak and Dabu, we gave them equal status when they presented their saris, and we called them designers, and they actually walked the ramp with the models at the end of the show. I thought that was according them a great status, because why should it always be that they are the lowest of the low. They are as creative as any big designer, more talented than many designers I know. Why is it difficult for us to view the artisan as an extremely talented designer? Every single one of us makes that mistake often in our lives. We bargain with them. I mean, a woman will go and spend two lakhs on a Louis Vuitton bag and wouldn't dare to argue in that store, but you feel free to walk into an artisan's shop or hovel or house or whatever and say, Kitne pe denge, the Indian anthem, you know, Kitne pe denge, is something that they have to put up with. I mean, we actually have signs at exhibitions saying, no bargaining, please. Why do we as Indians devalue our own product so much, Lavanya? I think some of this has to do with awareness. Um, now, a branded bag, one of the luxury brands, 
there is so much branding behind it. They say, look, we use the finest quality leather, it's made in our factories in Milan, and so on and so forth, right? But the artisan who puts out, say, a beautiful Kanjivaram or a Banarsi sari, he doesn't have that platform. He doesn't brand it, but he's using the best quality silk. He's using something where you can fold it, keep it in your cupboard, and three generations later, your granddaughter will pick it up, and it wouldn't have frayed on the edges, because that's how strong and how uh, you know, excellent the silk is. He's using pure zari, right, which is gold, uh, gold thread. He doesn't brand it. And so when he doesn't brand it, uh, there's a little bit of that which is lost. right? And consumers, uh, the end consumer, I think if they recognize this, and it's happening through a lot of the 100 Sari Pack and the revival programs and a lot of um, talk now that's, ha that's you know, happening in that space, I think as the consumer gets more sensitized to this and they recognize it is painstaking, it takes three weeks to make, a, to make this particular sari. It takes sometimes seven months to make that particular sari. Everything from the dyeing technique to you know, how the weaving technique and so on. And then there is the weaver is not a factory worker. He's a creative entrepreneur, right? He's not mass producing something. Uh, so I think the more awareness there is on what goes into the product, automatically people will start to value it for what really it is and how unique it is and how somebody who's given you something like this, it, he, can't, he can't run the line and give you another exact same type. Another thing I'd like to say is also talking about why is it that we devalue it as a community and as a society. I think also we have to take responsibility that it's our heritage. So do we need to be bribed to buy our own products is a question that I'd really like to ask. We go and buy it only when we see that 20% discount. And I think that's something that needs to really change because it's something that belongs to all of us. So why should we have to ask for a discount when we uh, support our own system and culture? But then again, we have a problem. Like, for example, the Prime Minister launched a beautiful site called Skilling, which gave young Indians opportunities to work in different fields and learn different skills. But in that Skilling website, there's not a single mention of hand skills, of the artisan, of weaving, of uh, printing, of dyeing. You know, Mahatma Gandhi once famously said, you put a loom in every home, and there'll never be poverty in India. And he was very right about it. But did we listen? No. Until today, I think a young man in a village in Rajasthan or Gujarat is being encouraged to open some kind of a lathe shop or a machinery shop or a bicycle repair shop. And they think of that as skilling. I think we need to collectively work on bringing the hand skills back into focus and telling the world that what we have is absolutely unique. Bangladesh is the only other country with any kind of a Khadi heritage or a handwoven heritage. And uh, besides the two of us, Pakistan's given up completely on it. Sri Lanka never had a weaving tradition. So that just leaves the two of us in the market. And India's size is 100 times that of Bangladesh's in terms of the market. But I think the time has come to translate that this product can become global. Because the other problem is, the next generation of weavers and dyers and printers who have seen their parents struggle so much do not want to enter the business. They'd rather go off and do IT and BT and learn other skills, and they don't want to see their grandmother and grandfather sitting there and, you know, chopping, block printing. But think times have changed. Today it has become a much bigger business, and I think recognition has come to a few of these artisans, proving that it can be done for everyone. What would you suggest that we do next on this? Talking about the next generation, okay, if uh, I have seen weavers turn into entrepreneurs and business people, so you can teach aesthetics, design sensibility, and things which will help them for their other production. So their sons who are MBA engineering boys come. If you show him it's a viable business, why would he migrate into a city and be a non-entity? So in most of my weavers, they are very successful business people who are rooted in weaving and in tradition. I think that's a great model to take forward because if you show them it's viable, great. Why is it that, so the government always tells me you are an accident. I can't be an accident for 45 years. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> and Lavanya, how do you find the public reacting to the beautiful products? I know you bring the best of handwoven saris to Nali's. You have practically every variety from the south to the west to the east and what little there is in the north. Is there anything in the north? 
There really isn't anything in the north, very little. Well, UP is, yeah, okay, we'll give you Benares. But Benares is beautiful. I mean, it is the queen of Indian textiles. I completely agree with that. And thank you, Deepika Padukone, for wearing a Banarsi to your wedding, because that made thousands of other young women choose to wear a Banarsi or a Kanjivaram at their weddings too. But we need to change our mindsets about our own products. We have got to see it as luxurious, beautiful, deluxe products that we need to pay good money for, that you should be willing to pay for a fine sari that you can put into your cupboard, wear with pride, and hand over to ch your children later, you know, of creating a heirloom, really. How do we go about educating people to, to respect our own developments and tradition? So I've been asked this question a few times. And to be honest, my, my own thought process on this has evolved with time. And now I, I'd like to tell people, you know, it's not an education. It's don't wear a sari because you feel you have to wear a sari. Wear it because you get to wear a sari, right? It's the, you get to wear a sari. It, where else do you have the luxury of wearing something that's someone's art, but you wear it, right, and it embodies you? We have so many things, we put ourselves through, as, I mean, I'll speak to the women here, but even the men. We put ourselves through so much of discomfort for silly things, right? How many of you own a pair of high heels? Right, what does it add to your life? It gives you backache, it, what does it do for you? Right? But you put yourself through that discomfort. And then still the same women come to us and they say, oh, but it's so inconvenient to wear a sari. Yeah. Right? And then, and, and how many men here own a tie? Right? What does it add? But you still put yourself through that. Saris add so much to your life beyond just the beauty, right? There is, and try this experiment. A day when you're feeling low, wear a sari. I guarantee you're not gonna yell at anybody. I guarantee you're not gonna get frustrated because you embody that, right? And also, the people that you come in touch with, they're used to seeing women in positions of power wearing saris. Teachers, bureaucrats, doctors, lawyers, a finance minister, right? Yeah. So, so try it, try it because you won't recognize the power that this has till you actually wear it. Don't wear it because you have to, wear it because you get to. And break tradition, wear it in different ways. Leave off the petticoat, wear it with a pair of light jeans. Wear it as a half sari, but wear it. Because I think that's the encouragement that the industry needs. And Pavitra, you are coming up with your 45th year's big celebrations at the Bangalore International Center next week. Tell us something about that. So this is a five-day event ha uh, happening at the Bangalore International Center. We've had a journey of 45 years, which started out as a necessity. But our main thing is to preserve design across wherever the origin of the design is and to train a weaver. So we do it by looking at his skills so that we can preserve that part of it, both in terms of effectiveness, in terms of what is possible instead of drawing something that's just a museum piece. And some of our productions, uh, designs have gone on for 40 years, like the Pooja Sari. I think almost everyone owns it. From and Indira we have Gandhi onwards, from yeah. Indira Gandhi, and we don't have ownership. We let go of design. So we create a design, let it go, and that has its own journey. I've also got a little museum of living textiles. I'd be happy if all of you come because it's a celebration. The Museum of Living Textiles is in Victoria Road, Victoria Layout, very close behind uh, Lifestyle. And uh, she's put together a collection of textiles from all over the country. And for those of you who are design students, it is a must visit, something you really need to go and see. Yeah. Have you been, Lavanya? You've not been there yet. You must go and take a look at it. It's absolutely fantastic. But I'm looking forward to your program, and I know that we're doing yeah, a small fashion presentation of the different drapes of India. So we are getting So all of you all, you must be there. Mel, are you listening to me? You'll be there. We are getting weavers from our Kambli weavers to people who worked to show them it's possible. You can start with two looms and go up to 80 looms, two houses to 20 houses. So the possibility is immense. If we could do it with no institution, anybody can do it. And it's a great way for livelihood support and preserving our textile culture. That's what I'd like to say. So I think we'll end on that note. We've said all we have to say. And again, congratulations to the women of India for having carried the great handloom tradition forward. Thank you.